and we're good. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, we are here today with Mark Hibble. Um, so we're going to go through and just talk a little bit about how to ask questions. If uh, you have any questions that you want to ask, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, our guests and what we're going to talk about today. So first things first, if uh, you're not familiar with Zoom and you've been living under a rock over the last couple of months, um, if you want to, you can jump into the chat bar at the bottom of the screen. You just mouse over your Zoom screen. You'll see that little chat icon jump in, feel free to put questions in. Um, you can share a question with all panelists or you know everybody if you wanna make it a little bit more of a discussion um, and we'll try to address it as we go. If um, you don't hear a question get answered or you wanna have it vocalized, uh, feel free to tag more and, and she'll try to make sure that your question is vocalized as we go through our conversation today. Beyond that, uh, if you're not aware, uh, my name is Chris Yoko, I'm the founder here at Yoko CEO. Um, our goal is to help organizations that have a passion or purpose beyond just profit build a better world. And we do that by helping them use the tool we think has the greatest leverage, which is their web presence. So web design, development, uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, I'm super excited to introduce Mark, uh, who we fortunately had the opportunity to work with a couple of years ago at a time when they were undergoing just a crazy amount of change, kind of a planned amount of change that everyone's going through now. Um, so super excited to introduce Mark. Uh, he's had decades of experience in the association technology space, so just massive technology platforms that are used to manage huge groups of people and move a lot of information. Um, you know, super immersed in technology and a fascinating background even before the, uh, the interaction with the uh, association space and uh, of course, a great bass fisherman. So welcome uh, aboard there, Mark. Thank you. Very cool. And so uh, what I wanted to be able to talk about today, and we'll go back over to our videos, is just, I mean, you guys went through such an incredible amount of change all at once um, at a time when, and you did it all on time and from what I heard on budget at a time when like doing one of those things on time and on budget is super rare. So for those of you that aren't aware, um, Mark's uh, organization, the, uh, American, uh, the American Ceramic Society, went through, a cor according, I think it was what, the same four or five month period, selected and went through a website redesign, replatforming their association management system. For those of you that aren't in the association space, that's kind of equivalent to a CRM in some capacities. Um, moved their corporate headquarters, helped to install a new executive director, and insourced their previously outsourced customer service component. All <laughs> so like, I mean, that's five years of projects for like a normal department to go through. And you guys did that all at the end of what was, I think it was 2017, we got uh, started working on that. Um, so one, just, I mean, I know that was kind of one of the reasons you were introduced to the organization, but if you could talk a little bit about just kind of that, you know, injection yeah, into uh, the organization. So I think uh, what a lot of associations are going through, uh, probably still going through and have been going through probably for the last five to seven, maybe even 10 years, is uh, trying to reimagine their business systems and trying to get away from the old AMS business model of, um, you know, you, you basically build out a platform that's more or less a one-off for what all the customizations you need. And then you pay silly support agreements for ever increasing. Right. And anytime you try to make any change, there's a significant cost involved because you have all of these customizations that you've built specifically for your association and what you needed. And uh, about five to 10 years ago, some companies started realizing that maybe there's a better way of doing this. And there's quite a few companies out there now that have what we call the new AMS, which allows it to be more flexible and stuff. And the American Ceramic Society was exactly in that space where they were stuck in that old system. They wanted to get on a new system. I had just finished moving the association I worked for before I came to the American Ceramic Society onto that new uh, new platform, one of the new AMSs. Mm -hmm. So I came in there to help get rid of all of that old legacy business systems. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, web presence is really your door to your constituents and to your customers and everything else. And so while you're, you're fixing the house in the back, you might as well be fixing the door in the front as well. And that's kind of how I look at it. It's my, my thought process. Yes, some people in the old way you would do just the AMS and then after you're finished with that, then do the web. Uh, it just made sense while we're making these changes, let's just kind of throw them all together. 
I had a lot of people say we were crazy to do it. A lot of people say we couldn't do it. But uh, I think if you get a great team and you go in with the right mindset, you can get it done. And you get great partners. Uh, all of that. It, it requires everybody to be to be the best of what they can be and get it done. So that's kind of where we were. Um, and because of the new AMS, it said, you know, we're going to improve our system so we don't need to outsource our customer service because we're going to allow our customers to self-serve more. And uh, the new platforms that we picked allowed that to happen. So that's kind of right. where we were. I did want to mention something else that came up in a conversation. We also changed, I, I, I run the IT for the society, but we hire a managed service company to handle all of our desktop support and staff support. We also changed that company in the process of all this. So not only we tell all of our staff, hey, listen, you know, we want you to use new software. We are going to use a new website. You know, you're going to be in a new office location that we're building out. Oh, we're bringing customer service house in house. Plus, if you have a problem, you got a new company you got to deal with. <laughs> so, it was kind of crazy. I mean, there's something to be said for ripping the Band-Aid off, I guess. But um, <laughs> exactly. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is, you know, all of these seem like kind of Herculean task. And anyone who's been in any organization where there's any kind of institutional inertia, like just changing one thing can be difficult, let alone it changing that many things and being able to try to do it in a concentrated time period and sometimes right, sometimes wrong. I think a lot of people tend to take that burden entirely on themselves and they try to insulate other people from it. And I, I think that your mindset on the way you work with, you know, a team and kind of your approach to incorporating everybody in change is a really, I mean, it's the only way I think you guys could have pulled off all the stuff that you pulled off. And so I just thought the way you vocalize kind of the way you think about including people in change is kind of interesting and maybe a little bit different than some others consider it. So if you could just speak to kind of your theory of embracing and distributing change is kind of the way you identify the players and how you incorporate and kind of honor everyone's role. Sure. I think, um, I, and this is a word that's probably overused and that's culture, although it's so critical to everything that we do is culture in everything that we do, whether it's business, personal, whatever it's called. Look at a new culture we have now because of COVID, you know, yeah. we're, we're all adjusting to that culture, the new culture that we have to live with. And, and, um, so you have to have a team that's willing to adjust the culture or willing to put aside what we've done in the past and stuff. And so um, that was critical to all of this working was making sure that if we didn't have that culture, we had a core group of people that are willing to adjust to that kind of a culture. Most of them want that kind of a culture. They're tired of the old, so they want it. They yeah. just don't know how they're going to get there. <laughs> and so, some of the things that I put in, in place is, for me personally, is I got to include everybody. I'm not going to leave anybody out on an island. So in the past, in the tech world, we would always, at, you know, the, the, the executive team would say, we've got this problem. Can you come up with a tech solution? We build a tech solution, and then we push it out to everybody. Right. Um, that's not how we do it anymore. Now we involve everybody and say, okay, you know, Executive level may see there's a problem, but the problem's really with the people doing the work, right? And it's the <laughs> people that do the day-to-day -day work. Yep. And so you've got to get them involved because if you get them involved, they know you're listening to their problems. And so if you're listening to their problems and you're helping them, let them help you create solutions, it's just much easier to happen that way. So, so really getting everybody involved, letting everybody talk, and then communicating on a regular basis, being very transparent in that communication and allowing that to just flow. And then one of the things I, I do uh, personal, I, I created a swear jar, either a virtual swear jar or a jar <laughs> we actually put on the table in the meetings back when we were all in the office and we had weekly meetings on this. And anybody in any of the conversations would bring up a term that was related to how we did it in the past or we have to do it this way or whatever. <laughs> They put it, that's like a swear. You put a dollar in there because you've yeah. got to get rid of that. You've got to stop thinking about how we did it before. What do you want to accomplish? What do you have to have? What is the result you're looking for? And then let's find the right solution to get us to that result. You know, where so many times it's like, no, we have to do step A, step B, step C so that we get to the, the final. Well, you know what? A, right. B, and C are variables that we can change. And let's Absolutely. see if we can make them better. 
Well, what I thought was I got a chance to, you know, obviously we worked together on the, the website side of it. And so I got a chance to see some of those communications. And one of the things that I thought you did just a really good job with, and the thing I thought was important to be able to share with our audience at large is the way that you were able to kind of tell the story of like why we're going through the change and the impact it was going to have on the organization. I think you did a really good job explaining, hey, yeah, there's going to be a lot going on, but it's worth it in pursuit of this. And you know, here's how everyone's involved. So everyone had a chance to have a voice and I got to see how you solicited some of that. Um, and then I can imagine a lot of people kind of cringing on like, does everyone really get a voice or do they get like a, a token voice where it's like, oh, we listen to you. Like, because some people will just be reluctant to change. And like you said, they'll just swear up and down in a new swear jar of like, well, we used to do it this way and I liked it this way and I got used to it this way. And so being able to take the people that are excited about change and incorporate and honor what they want to do with it, knowing that they might overblow, like we could do this thing and then this thing and this thing, you're overexcited. But then you've also got the people that are going to be bumps on the log and be negative about everything. And I think you did a very masterful job of kind of incorporating, but then also identifying those people. So you could go like, okay, great. Here's how this person needs to be included. Here's how this person needs to be included and keeping them all involved, but meeting them where they are and knowing where you're going to hit resistance and kind of how you need to overcome that if, uh, if and when it pops up. Well, I think you hit the, the nail on the head by saying, you know, it's, it's not just a token, we're going to hear you. It's yeah. listening and, 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 and showing that you're listening by incorporating either intelligent changes that they're bringing or helping them understand the difference between what you're asking for and what we can get to and allowing you to be part of that journey of getting there and seeing how it's in impacts some of the other things that happen. So, cause so many people work in silos. So they think, well, from, you know, membership, well, I need to have this and event says we need to have this. Well, you know, they impact each other. So get all those together. And, and like you said, it's, it's really truly involve them. Don't just make it a, a statement actually involve them let them know and let them know when decisions are made and and you you've heard this because we work together don't go to bed mad right like, <laughs> i can't expect you we got to manage expectations right so we have to i how many times have i told you my expectations can be managed you know just because i'm the money side of this project doesn't mean that i'm always right and but you got to have you have to believe in that internally first you can't I can't just say that and then let you say something and me get upset about it <laughs> right absolutely. you know I have to understand and take that as constructive criticism that I'm trying to become better at this and wow I either didn't do a good job of explaining the expectations to you or my expectation I just went off the wrong way and you bring me back up you know you brought me back in and your team's brought me back in many times and then sometimes you guys have thought differently than what we were expecting and just aligning those so that all of that put together shows that you care right and shows that right. you are listening to people and that you're willing to change i have to be as willing to change as everybody on the team well what i loved about that is i, I think we have a mutual philosophy on how you incorporate people and you truly listen versus you get consensus like I, those are very different things we're like look we sent everyone a survey that said we're going to do these things and they all said that was fine because i didn't know there was alternative and we didn't really suggest one to them what i think you did a great job with um was a, again being able to explain the purpose but making sure that everyone understood hey here's the outcome as an organization and let me also understand what kind of outcome you need as an individual to play your role in that outcome because there's so many little pieces and facets and obviously with a background in IT, you get this more than I think many people would, but there's a lot of this nuance to how people who may do the exact same job do it very differently. And if you don't solicit and get that information, you can't incorporate, like there's no way to incorporate it. So whenever you think about managing those expectations, it's about being able to gather all of the expectations together first so that they can then be managed. Right. Um, and it's that reminds me, though, as you mentioned that, it reminds me, one of the things that I, I ran into was you, you talk about the different personality types and stuff, right? And there's some yep. people that would sit in a meeting and wouldn't speak up, right? Because it's not their nature to speak up. And you have to kind of recognize that 
and then figure out how to get them incorporated into it. Because if they don't say it, and I, and I would tell them many times in meetings, listen, if you don't, if, you know, especially when you come to that point where you have a deadline, you've got to make a decision on this project, this part of the project and move forward. And at that point, I'm like, we are going this way with this product and this, this solution. If you have a problem, you have to speak up now, because if you don't, you're not going to get to speak up later. And so sometimes you'll have those ones that just will not speak up. And so you may <laughs> want to pull them aside later or something, but it is in corp making sure everybody is fully involved. And that's one thing that I do, as you were saying, that reminded me that we do have some staff, some staff are all again, like me, I'm very <laughs> passionate about, you know, I'll, I'll give you all the, all the right. information you want and all the suggestions in the world. Some have great suggestions. They just won't voice them because they don't want to, you know, they, it's their personality type or whatever. So finding a platform or finding a way to get that integrated into the project is critical. So, yeah. There's some interesting ways. Um, I forget the organization we were working with that had done this. They'd introduced me to the concept of, they called it Roman council. I don't, the story was they would go around from the most junior person to the newest person in the organization and ask them for their opinion first and then go all the way up to the, the oldest or the most senior person. Because if the most senior person speaks first, then everyone just nods along and you lose all the good ideas. I love uh, that. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to solicit the opinions and kind of be like, hey, you've got to say something. Um, I got the other, the other point <laughs> is um, the, the more kind of introverted people or what we found is like in our team, especially. I figure out what I'm thinking by talking and then some ideas come out. And I'm like, Oh, that's what I meant. But other people like they want to be able to think and they want to reflect. And so I'd gotten so used to running meetings where I'd be like, Oh, well, I'll talk about our ideas and we'd run with it. And then two days later, somebody would be like, Hey, I really had time to reflect on that. And now like, here's all this great wisdom. And I was like, Oh, we already started on all these things. And now I missed out on all these great ideas. And so being able to give people, um, like even in our process now, we've built in like a 48 hour period to say, hey, for those of you that are gonna be people that wanna think and reflect on this, here it is. You've got two days to kind of email us back and share us, you know, we'll kind of resolicit your opinions. Um, and if you wanna keep it private, you can do that too, because some people don't like to be too outspoken, but absolutely just figure out mechanisms to incorporate hearing everybody. So you kind of get yeah. all those. And That's kind of interesting, because you guys have, already, have always kind of been a uh, distributed group. Yeah. And I wonder, I'm actually working on the project, as you know, on the other half of the business for the American Ceramic, the art side of the business, we're going very similar to what we did in 2018, where we did all these things, everybody said we were crazy. Well, now it's an expectation of mine that we do this stuff all over, <laughs> so we're doing it again for the art side of the business. But now, you know, the other one, we were all together in an office, you know, and everything. And so we're using tools, and I guess I need to start thinking about some of these tools like you're mentioning here, and seeing how I can incorporate those into um, this project because it's not the same as having us all in and having that swear jar on the table and having Absolutely. people interact the same. Although everybody's, we're getting this, right? We're all getting the Zoom, to whatever <laughs> it is. We're all getting used to this. And, you know, we're fortunate. We're all still working at home and we have not skipped a beat in production, at least that we can tell and everything. If anything, yeah. we may have improved it a little bit, but, but, it does add, add a new dynamic to uh, these type of projects that I probably should start thinking closer about uh, how to make sure I don't lose some of those in-person tools or, or activities that were a, a critical part of how we succeeded on the first project. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. There's yeah. all those variables a person brings to the table that are just a part of them. Yeah, we're supposed to be doing this to give people information. Now we're asking <laughs> well, what I think questions is a, for people. <laughs> so fascinating about, you know, you went through all that intense change and it was planned. I mean, that was a part of the reason that you even joined the organization was you knew that you were going to come in here and implement some pretty massive changes within the, the infrastructure of the organization. And you did it all, like I said, on time, on budget, in a very short time frame. A lot of it started with obviously that consensus. What, what I'd love to be able to do is if we can think about packaging up the salient advice we learned from that period of time into, okay, now that that change is forced upon you and some of it's happened without the benefit of the pre-planning that you'd like to have, right? Like COVID kind of came and now people are working remotely, whether they like to or not, and people are scrambling. So it's what kind of things can we learn from and borrow from that period of time that apply now? And with also maybe just honoring and letting people know 
hey, like, just because a Kaguya guard, like, you can always say, like, all right, starting now, we're starting planning. Not feel like you're always caught, caught off guard. Um, and I'd be interested in kind of how would you think, what would – you, I mean, you're going through this right now, obviously with the art side of the business. So what kind of things did you kind of say like, all right, to start, like, here's what we need to really get our arms around and what kind of action well, tips might you have? I, well, um, first I want to say that um, I think the second go round is better be, or easier because, you know, I came in, we talked, the executive team talked to the team about making changes. You know, it's not the first time they've gone through changes, but the changes, you know, a lot of what I said we could do, you know, they heard before, and we're running into this on the, the, the current project, you know, and getting their buy-in is kind of difficult because you haven't proven yourself. So, and I think, so I think from the very beginning, you have to have that mindset is that you, you've got to prove yourself. And so in that, you know, making sure you communicate on a regular basis, making sure you truly involve everybody, and then, and then making key points, key performance indicators or, or, or areas where you can start with some small successes early mm. because they buy, you get you, right. It gets you that buy-in because right. they, you know, they've heard it. I've heard it before, you know, how many different IT guys have they had before me <laughs> that all probably said the same thing and it, it didn't come across that way. So it's really trying to overcome that part of it. So um, I'm trying to think if, your, your original question was what are some of the, the things to start off with? Yeah. So, I mean, just people that find themselves like a, for a lot of folks, you know, they're not used to working remotely and you guys always, I think we're ahead of the curve in terms of your, you know, IT infrastructure and being able well, to, yeah, work, for this, for that to, side to work remotely. Yeah. Um, but if you were an organization, like let's say you were in an organization that just hadn't worked remotely. Now suddenly you had to, and people have been working remotely. There's some zoom fatigue going on. And now they're like, we've got to, wrap our hands around this and transform our organization kind of, you know, repair the airplane while it's in flight almost. Um, what would be kind of the first things that you would do if you were just kind of popped into that organization? Well, that's what I was kind of trying to think of because now that we have this different environment and, and on the art side of the business, what we're doing is when we were on the side tech side of the business, the first part in 18, we were all together. So I think things happen more organically than they are now. We're, we're getting by, you know, we're, we're having our meetings and everything else, but those side conversations may not be happening or stuff. So I'm thinking along, maybe I need to start doing some kind of a coffee hour or even, you know, once every two days or something, just have the whole team get together for 15, 20 minutes to say what's going on and stuff. And because, and I don't care, you know, tell me about your new puppy. Tell me about anything, but right, let's yeah. have that conversation because that's the conversation that's missing right now that I think we had in the first project that may have added to the culture of, oh, yeah, this Kibble guy's not so bad. You know, he's doing what he's doing <laughs> or, or I be the same way. The other, you know, the staff that are really quiet, I was able to figure out which ones are the really quiet ones by just their interaction with them that I don't have now that we're virtual, right? So maybe right. finding some way of getting that in there would really be the only difference. Other than that, it's it all goes together. It all, as long as you communicate on a regular basis, you include everybody, whether it's virtually or in person, I think you're still going to get the same results. Yeah, for sure. And I think one of the things that's interesting is the little wins, I think, go a long way. So being able to articulate, hey, we were able to affect this change uh oh, did we lose Mark? Or did you guys lose me? Lauren, are you there? I'm there. I'm here. Okay. Uh oh, we lost Mark. Uh, Hopefully, we get him back. Uh, oh, we got him back. We got him back for a moment. Just for a moment, yeah. Did you see the new question that just came in? Oh, thank you, Michael. Let's see. John Cutter's change phase. Oh, interesting. So I know a fair amount of kind of the metrics they use, but I'll-, I'll Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. There we are. Can you hear me? We, we can. can. Okay, I think, of course, the tech guy's having issues, right? That's how it <laughs> works. The tech guy says, I have bad internet and I've got 200 meg here. I don't know what the problem is. So <laughs> I apologize. No worries. Um, so when we got interrupted, when we were obviously talking- me, 
Yeah, we were just talking about, um, you know, kind of implementing it within an organization that was just kind of caught off guard by COVID as so many have. Um, Michael actually threw a question in that I think is interesting. Um, was the work informed at all by John Cotter's change phases or a different kind of change management uh, framework or process? Uh, not, not, a, not a defined or, or uh, detailed process. I didn't follow anybody's process. Uh, this is just common sense for me of what I would want from my perspective if I was on the other side. So from a change management, perspective, it may fall into one of those, you know, known entity type change management uh, protocols. Mine is really just, it's really just basic. Involve everybody, uh, let them know ahead of time that it's coming, let them know why we're making the change, let them be involved with why we're making the change and how it's going to improve them, and then show them, like you said, the little wins, right? Let, let them see those little wins and let them see that we truly do care and we are making the difference. I was going to say, one of the biggest concerns of all of the staff on the side tech was bringing customer service in because right. they were getting week monthly reports of here's how much this company's been doing for us in customer service. Right. And the old AMS that we had was they were told all, oh, all oh, customers will be able to do it themselves, but they never <laughs> were, you know? Right. And so being able to show them early on, how customers will be able to do the things that they currently don't. So we looked at, you know, 50 some calls a day and we reduced them down to one to two phone calls a day. I mean, it really is. They will tell you, you can ask those people that were all scared to death. You know, they were thinking we need to order, hire three staff to handle customer service calls. And I'm like, we knew what the, the customer service needs were ahead of time because we had a company that built us for it. So if we had that list. And then we could actually identify, we'll see here, password resets make up 35% of your calls. Right. Here's how the password reset's going to work for the new customers. They're like, oh my gosh, yeah, that, we won't have that problem anymore. So those little steps. So I apologize that I don't follow a, a, a standard, uh, but there's probably elements of all of them that maybe I have followed because I've read so much on change management, you know. Uh, I mean, I think you get the results. That's what uh, yeah. ends up ultimately yeah. mattering. Well, and what I think was also interesting is um, Michael had asked about kind of what metrics were used uh, to kind of measure success. And I thought that was one of the interesting things that, again, you guys were pretty good at is one, uh, I think you mentioned like, you know, decreasing inbound customer service call yeah. volume. What I know was a big one when you guys in-housed it. And that was a part of also the objective whenever we thought about information architecture of the website, uh, the way the AMS credentials and like single sign-on worked across your different platforms. Yeah. Um, were there any, you know, kind of softer measures or metrics or metrics that maybe we haven't mentioned that should be brought to bear in the conversation? So all the, to me, when we talk metrics, I kind of call them pain points, right? So I asked the staff, what are our pain points? What are our customer pain points? And we use those pain points as our measurements. So, you know, one of the things membership had an issue was our corporate partners had to call in. They couldn't do it online. So we provided a solution between the web part of it and the AMS part of it that allows us to communicate that better with their customers so they can. It all revolved, almost all of our metrics revolved around self-service and being able to let people do things that they couldn't do in the past which means that they, we get more people registered because people don't drop off. We get more people yeah. to renew their membership because we make it really easy for them to remove, new, renew their membership. You know, if they want to purchase something, we've made it very easy for them to purchase. And we, we know about them. We're really starting to leverage our tools to use AI and machine learning. We're looking at putting in chat bots because now, although we used to get, I, I forget what the numbers were, so I'll just throw them out here, but like we would get 30 to 50 calls a day and we would get, you know, 50 to 100 emails a day. Well, right. the calls dropped way down. We're still getting some emails, but not as many, nearly as many. They've dropped by, I think, 40% or if not more. The, the context of the emails have changed, but <laughs> sure. we are finding, we're finding that we can probably answer a lot of these questions through a chat box. So maybe that'll be a, you know, in, in the past, we didn't have that capability, but now that we're on that new platform, it opens up the doors for continuous change down the path. And so now that they're bought into the change, they're party, they're bringing those kind of questions to us and saying, hey, we are noticing this, what can we do to make this better? That's a, yeah, a really important point too, is I mean, those, 
little victories add up, you get some momentum going. And then what's really nice about that is once you implement a big system-wide change like you guys did is now you've got the credibility that it's like, hey, we did it before we could do it again. And then you kind of have some consensus and it's a, a little bit more of a well, process. What goes with that too is tools and vendors, right? So we right. got the right tools and we got the right vendors to help us do that so we can continue doing that. Because it is, it is, it's not just one half of it. You know, we're just one half of this equation or one third, depending on what all we're talking about. You know, right. it, it took a bunch of us to get this done. There was never an I commented in anything that, you know, I, I know when working with you guys, nobody ever says I did anything. It's we did something, you know, and the same yeah, little things like that make a big difference. It really does make a big difference. And it's very easy to do, you know, when they hear that, when they, they know when we say we, they're a part of we, you know, the staff are a part of we. When we made changes, they were a part of it. So, and it's really, it's pain points. I mean, why, why change? If you don't have pain points, right? What my dad always say, why, why fix something that isn't broken? Yeah, don't right? fix it if it ain't broken, for sure. Yeah, so, so it's really pain points are your metrics. You just, if you can clearly define your pain points and then what, what it takes to get rid of that pain, there, there's your metrics. Yeah, that makes sense. What I think is interesting about that, if we think about the situation people find themselves in now, is there's, I think, a lot of people grappling with the broader changes that this has brought about like oh how do we adapt to working remotely how do we make sure our culture stays intact or how do we adapt a new culture that kind of better supports this working mechanism and a lot of people are caught up with a lot of the big picture changes and i feel like that feels more intimidating to you know begin to approach but to your point a lot of the little wins and kind of notifying what are a lot of those little points are things that are really easy to do now where you can do a survey hey what do you like about working from home? What do you not like so much? Start to get some of those pain points and then take, you know, a small handful that you're able to address maybe relatively easily within a couple of weeks as the ones you do first to get some of those initial wins before you start approaching, you know, steering the giant ship in a different direction is get some of those little wins, get people to let you know that, hey, I heard you. These are some things we're going to take a look at. Here's hopefully what we've done or how we're going to go about making this change. Does this make your life better? And then if yes, okay, great. Now we can start to articulate what this bigger vision looks like. And now you have a little bit of credibility towards moving in that direction. I, I would think would be a nice immediate thing somebody could do if they were kind of immediately put in this situation. Does that kind of resonate with the, the philosophy you would have? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a change. I was just, I'm sorry. I was kind of distracted because I was looking at the questions in there. Uh, but uh yeah, I mean, if one of those questions struck your fancy, I mean, feel free. Let's yeah, well, I know uh, I've, I've had this question before. Uh, it talks about like how do you get past those impasses, right? Or when when you know you when you involve a large group of people, you get a large group of opinions, and it's it's very hard to come with to a consensus and move forward. And we do have a timeline. We have to knock this stuff out. So we almost right. have to define a timeline and try to steer the conversation to a final decision. And sometimes you just get to a point where, okay, we've talked about this enough. We know there's probably still some more to talk about, but we're at a point where to, to keep this timeline of this overall project, we need to move on. And you, you just have to be very transparent, say it's time to make the decision. Let's as a group make it and then move on and then not fall back into it later. You know, that's the other right. key. Don't let it come back up again. Or when it comes back up, make sure you've documented it well enough that you can say, well, remember when we had this problem? You know, let's put this down for phase two improvement. Maybe we can revisit it then. But the overall project had to be moved on. So, yeah. Well, and to that point, that seems to be, I mean, especially now that like projects never end, right? Like projects just like, all right, we're continuing to iterate and build on systems, on top of systems. Here's right. the process that ties into it. What tools or you know, process or methodology do you guys use internally to kind of track or document like major changes or, hey, there was a fork and we went left instead of right. And here's why we went with this tech stack instead of that tech stack, et cetera. Like, how do you guys tend to document? Yeah, so we used a lot of different tools. We used uh, 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 Basecamp was probably our main communication because it could include everybody, including our vendors that we were working with. Uh, and, but then we also used internally, we used uh, shared calendars for timelines. 
We also use shared calendars because another hard part about a project of this size with a lot of people involved is those blackout times. When people right. are on vacation and stuff and making sure you consider all that. And that really comes down to the project manager's responsibility to, to do that, which in our case was me as well. So, <laughs> and I've done enough of it. So I've got project management, uh, you know, experience. So, but it's really just falling, all of this, everything, even programming and IT all falls back into basics, just solid foundational basics. If you have those in place, the swear jar we threw, group mail, you know, all of those type of things that allowed us to, to actually move past that. We had timelines, everybody knew what they were. And there were times when people couldn't be involved because they're out of office or whatever reason. And they understood that. That's part of the thing. We have to move on, you know. So I do like another question that I think uh, Michael asked was, uh, I think I'm actually, uh, let's say I'm not sorry. Uh, but somebody asked, what about, you know, we, these were all plan changes, right? So it's yeah. kind of easier. But somebody asked about un, unplanned changes and or unexpected changes. And that... It's a great question. We, I did not plan on being involved in the office move at all. That wasn't originally on my radar. It wasn't supposed to be on my radar. When I got hired on, I had three main goals, and I ended up having, I think, a total of eight in that same year that we did uh, all of these projects. You know, So um, it's just it comes with the same foundations that you use for change, for plan is the same for unexpected. It just might be escalated or, or uh, expedited because it wasn't included. And so you need to manage expectations, right? So you hear me say that a lot, manage expectations. So those people that, um, that you've already asked to dedicate time, if they're part of these new unplanned changes that you need to realize that and adjust the expectations for those people. Right. Because Absolutely. You, although I'll work eight hours, that's not everybody on the team will do that. So you have to, you know, be respectful of that as well. Yeah, I think there's the I mean, there's obviously the management of expectations and that kind of deviates or builds upon just clear communication. Hey, here's the end state we're trying to build towards. Here's why it matters. And like, yeah, we're dealing with finite time, finite resources. So some things will happen and some things won't. It won't be a dream state, but it will be better than what it was previously. And then um, what else I think is interesting is, you know, you talked a little bit about what happens if, you know, people start to bring back up, well, like, why did we go in this direction? And I know that's a bear for tons of organizations where, you know, there's somebody who's like, well, see, I told you so. Like, sure, this stuff is better, like, but that thing isn't going to work or there's going to be this thing and there's going to be some negativity and that might help maybe identify more of the types of teammates you have than anything else. Um, but with that, if there's ever a need to kind of go back and retroactively kind of justify decisions or the logic made, I've found the, just like the meeting notes to be so important. <laughs> we use a, a wiki internally to kind of keep, you know, some documentation on like, hey, we could have gone with, you know, uh, Slack or Microsoft Teams. And we went this way because of this reason. And we could have gone with, you know, WordPress or Sifinity. And we went with, you know, WordPress yeah. for these, or whatever the case might be. There's a ton of those choices. And we're getting to a place where like any one of those might be called into question at some point in the future. Not necessarily from a negative standpoint, but from a, oh, great. Like we want to incorporate this other technology, which is difficult. Why did we do this thing the way we did it in the past? And then, you know, surface it up to, you know, whether it's a developer, a new person who's come onto the team. I'm just finding that more of that institutional logic and history is becoming more and more apparent, uh, more and more important to make apparent and to make really easily accessible to team members. So they can kind of understand the position the organization was in, the headspace, when those decisions were made. So they can either keep on track with that trajectory and build onto systems that are going to be compatible or if there's been a change of direction, understand like the true cost of making some of these changes retroactively because right. I don't know if you've seen this and I think this is a time when there's also a lot of turnover just in terms of people in different positions and roles. And so if new people are coming in, they want to put their stamp on it and they want to tear out the old system and put in the new uh, without necessarily knowing like the full context of why the system was put in the way that it was and what 
problems you as somebody who or is new may not be aware of uh, that maybe you do need to be aware of. And so just kind of the importance of that documentation. I was wondering if, I mean, obviously, you know, you'd mentioned base camps and having the shared calendars and that does some historical tracking, but were there any other kind of elements that you really feel need to be flagged or pulled out, especially when you're dealing with such instrumental things across the whole of organization? Were there any things where you just said like, hey, we want to make sure we pull these out and make sure this is information that's accessible to kind of the next generation of people that might be inheriting these systems? Yeah, the, the, yeah, that's it's a very good element that I don't think about often, but I'm glad we did it when we need it, right? Uh, <laughs> For sure. It's a pain when you're doing it because it's taking up time and you're like, oh, I'll remember, I won't need this. But when <laughs> you need it, you fall back on it. You're so happy you have it. And that comes back to that, you know, a lot of that, um, my training in project management and stuff and experience of not having it, which I did. Uh, true. But uh, on the projects that I've done uh, since coming to the American Ceramic Society, we clearly document all of that. We have discovery documents that says, here's the requirements. We have solution documents that says, here's how we're going to meet those requirements. And then we have scope that actually says what those, how we're going to, how we're going to implement those solutions and what it's going to take to implement those. And we clearly define the things that are going to either be phase two or that we had um, not a hundred percent concession concession <laughs> on how we were going to go, you know? So, and it, it does come back. And here's what I have found is in those conversations that you had, like when you were talking with a vendor or you were start, when you were doing your discovery, you mm -hmm. will have discussions about, oh yeah, well we can do this and we can do that. Right. right. But when we do the, the actual scoping and the solutions, we don't incorporate all of those things that they saw. But a year or two later, they're gonna say, well, I remember when we sat in a meeting and it, you said it would do this. Yeah, well we did, but here's the document says, we're going to not have that part of it. So it's very critical that you do that documentation. I'm glad you brought that up because that, and we have, we, we clearly define what that is. We define this, the need, the requirement, the solution, and then the scope of getting it done. And as part of that, it also defines those that we are not going to do that we have discussed. Interesting. Okay. So, because that's what I have found. I haven't found as much about, you know, we said we were going to do this and we didn't do it. You know, that, 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 that very rarely happens with me and in any project I do. If we say we're going to do it, we're going to do it. You know, if we don't, if halfway through we realize we're not going to be able, we're going to document it somewhere because I, it will come back to bite me later. <laughs> I was going to say worse, but yeah, it'll come back. It's CYA, right? <laughs> right. So, no, that's a really good point because a lot of people, I think, you know, there's the, the importance of the documentation around, okay, here's what we did and why we did it and do, 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 do. But there is that additional context that comes around from it. Like you said, the things that came up in conversation that were possibilities that maybe didn't get jotted down or they were in the margins of somebody's notes and then they're lost forever to history. Um, but I feel like now probably coming more out of the world of like ongoing, just constant software development, there is that premise of, okay, we've got a running backlog and a features list and we've yeah. got a, um, uh, what should I call it? Not as a technical debt document where we know, right. And we're being intentional about like, yeah, we're not going to upgrade that right now. And we know it's going to bite us later and it's going to bite us about this much to this much. And that's an acceptable amount of risk and like trying to really formalize a lot of that. Um, knowing I would tell you, I would like to add one thing though. I would like yeah. to tell you is in my wisdom, my older gray wisdom here, and I wish <laughs> I'd known this a lot longer uh, or earlier on in my career is just because we discounted it in 18, doesn't mean we shouldn't maybe revisit it now because things have changed. Why we couldn't do it at 18 or we couldn't do it in 15 or we couldn't do it in 10. Don't get stuck in the part because you're going to have those people that are still there that did things in 10 and they say, oh yeah, well, we tried that and it didn't work. Well, you know what? It's not 10 anymore. It's 2020. All I'm saying is maybe it's worth looking at a revisit. So, so it comes from both sides. It comes from the need side and the solution side, right? And both Absolutely. of you have to be flexible and say, you know, yeah, we talked about it and here's why we don't have it, but do we need to talk about it again? You know? That's a good point. I mean, especially, I mean, one, there is just kind of the nature of the beast where things continue to evolve and hopefully, you know, for the most part get better. But I mean, also, I mean, most of the change that we implement now is driven by either directly or indirectly software and systems. And right. 
it's incredible how much can change in a couple of years. I mean, I remember when we first got exposed to HubSpot when they were, I guess, a little bit more than a startup, but it was like 2012 or something. And that system was terrible. And we were like, this yeah. will never go anywhere. And we put it in the ground. And that was that until, I don't know, somewhere around like 2016 or 17, where we ended up becoming, you know, a partner and the system's come a long way and it is a lot better. But for a number of years, we were telling people like, ah, you probably don't want to use that because we'd had that one bad experience. So there is that difficulty. And I'd be interested in your mentality on it just because there are so many systems that do so many things and everything's evolving so quickly. How do you guys as an organization keep tabs on what makes sense to, you know, take a look at what kind of crosses your level of awareness as things that are interesting to learn more about um, what kind of things do you do just to educate yourself on, ongoing technology that might be useful to the organization as a whole. Yeah, so I think there's two elements to it. One of it's expectation. We, we have to adjust our expectations because now technology is the new startup mentality in the agile, right? Yeah. Uh, create the my, minimal viable product and then it, iterate it better as you move along, right? So that's a whole new thought process that we have to do to, to make that different, right? And then um, the second part of that question was, I'm sorry, refine, refine the... Oh, just knowing that there's so many, I mean, there's obviously so many new systems and platforms right. and startups okay. is how do you pay it? Like, stay what do you do? The shiny objects is what I call that. <laughs> stay away from the shiny objects, right? Because there's, uh, believe me, there's a technology out there to fix anything, right? right? So it's really making sure we define what needs fixed first and what the true fix is, like what is the problem and what are we trying to fix? And then finding the best solution that fixes that and don't pay attention to all the shiny objects that are gonna show you why they're showing that solution because I'm not planning on using those. I, that's not a solution to fix my current problem. So, and, and uh, the executive team hears me say that often, especially tech guys, we love shiny objects, right? <laughs> I mean, I got to have the newest, greatest tablet. I got to have the newest laptop. I want the fanciest mic, you know, uh, all of that kind of stuff. But we really, I don't really need it, right? So we have to be respectful of the cost and the effort to put through to just bring shiny objects. So try to remain, remember what you're trying to fix and stay just in that little bubble. That's, it's hard to do. That's, no, I really appreciate that. It reminded me of, um, I don't remember who it is that has the quote, but he was like, you put blinders on a racehorse for a reason. <laughs> and it's like, they get the race yeah. done. You take yeah. them off, suddenly they're, oh, look at this. There's this horse next to me. I need to fight. I need to get distracted. And yeah. there is really a role, especially now. I mean, it's been bad for years, but like you said, I mean, now there's a solution for everything and yeah. we'll becoming more and more, you know, severe. I mean, we see clients all the time. They're like, should we be on uh, TikTok? Should we be doing Instagram? And it's like, Maybe, but most likely not. Like most likely you've just heard about these things or you've read about them and you feel like you should be doing that. And then there's, you know, oh, can we do text message marketing? And it's like, maybe it's figure out what problem you want to solve and work backwards to, to select the yeah. platforms and the tools from there is old and tried and true knowledge, but I think so easily forgotten. And yeah, I'm dealing with it right now because, you know, with this new COVID and everybody working remotely, everybody and their brothers come out with a new solution that's better to manage your staff that are working remote, you know? Well, yep. we're not having a problem, so I don't know. <laughs> you know. I mean, I am a little bit concerned, of course, around security because there's a little bit difference, but those are smaller steps for me to take. They're not, you know, it's not shiny objects. It's, it's a, a true need and we'll look at how we would address any type of new security uh, risks that have been exposed because of this. And we'll obviously answer those, but until we have a need, I don't have to worry about all these new great things. You know, it's been terrible trying to figure out Zoom, Teams, you know, <laughs> you know, and we, we, we were Zoom, we're staying with Zoom until there becomes a problem with Zoom that we have to talk about something else. Then we'll look yeah. at something else, you know, so, and that's the same in the projects. And when you're working through these projects, just keep focus. I love that, the blinders with the horses, that's perfect. Yeah, it makes a, a ton of sense. And it's interesting. I'm being mindful of time and the fact that you brought up security uh, is a good time to talk a little bit about, you know, we've certainly seen a rise in attempted, you know, exploits across the board. Um, I mean, a lot of, you know, we host and maintain infrastructure for a lot of clients and organizations. And so we see a lot of attempts and like, fortunately, we're buttoned up and most of those are pretty amateur in nature. So they get shut down. But the phishing schemes, especially, are yeah. more and more sophisticated. Um, 
I am friends with a guy named uh, Floyd who runs a company up in Canada where they took clips of him from YouTube yep. speaking, fed it into an AI to synthesize yep. his voice and then Scary. WhatsApped a bunch of his finance department to try to get them to wire him money, pretending it was an emergency. It was the most sophisticated phishing attempt I've ever seen. He was in the news for it. It's crazy. But I mean, that's the new level we're dealing with is there's a ton yeah. of people that have a lot of free time to uh, be the, what is it, idle hands or the devil's play things, I think it is. Yeah. So. It's, it, it is scary. And, and from a tech side of it, just if there's, for the tech people may be listening, I mean, you know, they all know this. It's, 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 the, it's the fingers on the keyboard that I can't control, right? <laughs> so yep. where that comes is the knowledge, right? In, in trying, there are some tools that can help eliminate all of those, but those really sophisticated ones don't get stopped all the time. Yeah. And so you really, and, and we're very fortunate. I've got a very intelligent staff. They, I don't know if they ever got hit before here. Uh, I don't think they have, but they, they are cautious of it. They, the, the IT people before have, have put that in their brain and they constantly, there isn't a day goes by, somebody doesn't send me, hey, a new phishing attempt, I stopped. I'm like, oh, great, <laughs> you know? But that, that goes back to what we talked about with the projects, right? And that's involving them. They know that they're part yeah. of this solution for this fishing, you know, so they share it amongst each other. It's awesome. You know, that's, that's how you, it's, it's all the culture changes, right? You got to have that so, level of awareness. And yeah. yeah, I mean, us being mindful of time, that's kind of a perfect transition for me to kind of I'll throw the screen share yep. back up here, because if people do want to follow you uh, and follow Acers, uh, you can get them all across uh, kind of the key social media network. So feel free to connect with Mark on LinkedIn or on Twitter, or you can of course follow Acers on Facebook. And uh, they've got, as you heard Mark allude to, a science side of the business, whereas ceramics in just about every bit of technology and building material you can think of. Uh, and then there's the art side of the business, which is all the classic uh, art that you would expect uh, from ceramics. So feel free to check them out. If you'd like to see a couple other places where you can connect, uh, you know, here's some information there and we'll of course keep it in the show notes. Um, but then also thinking about just natural transitions is uh, our next webinar is gonna be on July 8th with uh, Heath Renfro from um, our partner, the Cripsis Group, uh, who are in the information security and cybersecurity space. And he's gonna tell us a little bit more about just the crazy bloom in attacks, attempted attacks, Mark, the importance of informing your team and making sure they're in the know and they don't fall for goofy, stupid, sometimes more sophisticated phishing attempts. Um, and what kind of things you can do to protect yourselves and your organization in a time when everyone is working remote and there's a lot of, there's likely more gaps in security than people are gonna be able to cover using just information technology and platforms. So it's really about informing the teams and making sure people kind of know what best practices are. So we'll be chatting with him on the 8th. Feel free to sign up if you'd like. It's at yokoco.com slash security. And uh, until then, we'll see you guys next time. Mark, thank you so much for being here. And uh, any last words before we close out? No, just uh, anybody ever have any questions, uh, they can reach me, uh, uh, mkibble at ceramics.org. I guess I should have given you that. Uh, if anybody yep, has right here. Yep. questions, want to talk, feel free to uh, reach out. I'd love to help anybody I can, and uh, I'll use you as a help back. <laughs> awesome. Thanks Thank again. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to that next one. I'm going to sit in on that one. That's it's going to be tell good. Me, tell They've me know what are shiny objects and what aren't, right? <laughs> They've seen some crazy stuff, so it'll be a good one. Cool. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Yep.